Okay, hello, hello, and welcome to this talk. I'm going to talk about the demystifying HP hacking, which stands for hardware hacking. As you can see, I'm a bit nervous, so let's do this. Okay, so who am I? My name is Tomi Koski. I have this online alter ego called TK0, and I work at Visma. As, as a red teamer, and I do a lot of weird stuff, such as I promised myself I won't do any dad jokes, so sorry if I do, because that was the first one, probably, no. Uh, usually I fiddle with everything IT, electronics related, or security related. I'm a good lock picker. I don't have any, like, you know, uh, uh, I have this ACID, ACID approach that I do stuff and locks open. That's my way. Not all, but some, yeah. And, yeah, okay. And I do some sports also, and an active member in Finnish uh, cyber community. So, yeah. And this is pretty much my childhood in one picture. And uh, those things have brought me here today. So. That was the first lang programming language which I learned, and soon I noticed that it ran out of performance with my beautiful IBM PS1 computer, so I had to learn assembler. And yeah, and in the meanwhile, I played all the Monkey Island games, all the Police Quest games, all the, you know, the good stuff. And this is pretty much my inspiration for everything. I wanted to know how you may copy these games to your friend without buying them, actually, so you had to do stuff. And this presentation pretty much sums up to this uh, uh, kind of phase from the phrase from the hacking handbook. So I pretty much was this child for my parents, so I used to break stuff and Back then, I didn't know how to fix them, but I managed to break them, and today I'm actually able to fix them too, so I'm, I have pro progressed. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some um, hardware hacking related stuff, and we're going to talk about how to get you interested in this um, beautiful beautiful hobby, and let's not overcomplicate anything. So I will talk about how the products has been made when I was uh, seeing it pr uh, pretty closely. So I was observing how the electronics manufacturing work and so forth, and I'm actually still using the very same tricks today as I was before. Uh, and we're going to look at how to do some recon, basic recon for electronics, some stuff related to equipment, and I introduced one development kit, which will be a boot camp, and then we're going to do some firmware extraction and HV debugging. So let's go. So what is HV hacking, hardware hacking? Basically, it's, it's basically that you just go to a store, you purchase this weird-looking uh, you know, web camera, then you open it up, you root it, and then you're going to enjoy your time finding really weird stuff like, you know, hard-coded credentials, stuff like that. And after you have done this for a while, this happened to me that then the bug bounty program started to say that, do you want to test this stuff? Do you want to test this stuff? And then the DHL, the TNT, even Posti sometimes managed to bring the packages to my house, and I got the stuff there, and it was fun. And life would be really, really boring with the plane defaults, so I really like to take most out of the stuff. Yeah, so this is the only downside of the, this uh, art, in my opinion. But since we, we are still doing this, so just to let you know, this is how easy it is. Usually it looks like this. Then you touch any wire, you're going to see some sparks, and then you are like, yeah, you know, you are pretty pissed, but 
this is how it usually looks like. And since probably people are more familiar with the web, web testing, so if we kind of compare the hardware hacking to web testing, so usually you have just the computer, you have a browser and the internet, then you go to the beach, you have beer and you hack stuff and that's it. But that's not pretty much at all what it's like with the hardware, because with the hardware, you still need the same stuff, but you still need the, uh, you know, all the tools. You need the transformers, you need the this and that, and I ran out, ran out of space in this slide even to list all the things you need, but you get the idea. You need stuff. So how are the normal electronics usually manufactured? So this is how I saw it at the electronics factory during 2000, around 2000. So, and I still see that the same things still apply today. And today, we're going to refer a thing which will be some weird piece of electronics, or our target, basically. So in my past, I used to, like said multiple times, there used to be actually uh, electronics manufacturing in Finland. I used to be one of the guys who was testing, developing, and researching like electronics network backbones. So basically, there we witnessed like batshit crazy stuff and really cool stuff. My personal favorite is that someone, we don't know who, but someone thought that it's a good idea to buy these um, flash chips, which are like not costing that much. So we purchased them, we put them in the machines. The machines produced like tens of thousands of units. We sent them all around the world. And then we found out that the flash, flash chips were actually used. And if you know block of cheese, you have cheese, you start to uh, take slice, and in the end you don't have cheese. So flash chip is pretty much the same. You can write them there like sometimes, but not like for eternal. And these were like network backbones, which meant that the settings of the networks were stored inside our units. And if the unit didn't know what is the setting, you might pretty much understand what was the impact. So if you couldn't make a data connection or phone call during 2000 somewhere, I was there. <laughs> okay, so how, how usually, how I saw it, and I still believe this happens today. So usually the first phase is that you will have a bare Print, printed circuit board, which doesn't have any components. Then you put it into the some machine, which will lay all the components into the board. Then you have a fully functional module. After that, you're going to take the module to a test station. You're going to test it, well, uh, several times. You're going to possibly key it. You're going to insert some secrets there. And all this time, you need to have these test points in the board, which are meant for measuring the board and uh, figuring out, does it actually work before we're going to ship it? And in the end, you will have a really, really cool product, which sometimes might have some test points which are still active. Uh, there could be some secrets inside the uh, actual finished product and so forth. So this is pretty much how it seems to be still today. Uh, and the problem is that if you have any piece of electronics, usually if you open like one, for example, a remote controller, if you open the battery cover, you can see some test points under the battery like a holder, because they have to test it just before they send it to the customer, basically. So when you have a, some unit or whatever thing, how do, do you do a recon for that? So basically, my very ad hoc approach is usually to look how the mobile or the uh, web, 
web interface works for that specific device. It, if it doesn't have one, well, then obviously not. But usually, the companies have built an ecosystem uh, around the products, like you know, doorbells, whatever. And we are usually after the firmware. So basically, the firmware is the uh, program running inside of the hardware. So the most easiest way to get your hands on the firmware is to download it from the internet. And uh, this doesn't happen that often, but sometimes you are really, really lucky. Sometimes you find a vulnerability from a website which allows you to download the firmwares, which you can analyze and so forth. And uh, one also easy way is to take one unit, just tear it down, look inside, and get the firmware from there. That's the easy, like a super easy approach. The harder part is that you're going to do exactly the same thing, but you get to figure out how I can get the firmware out. Basically, how can I um, figure out which pins, which, which uh, connectors, and so forth are connected to the product in a way that you can get a, get a, a, a firmware. And uh, one hard, hard way to do it is to disorder some flash chip, dump it, and put the flash chip back to the device, which is like pretty painful usually. But I use this YOLO approach, so I just, I just open the device and I, I look what's in there and I try to figure out something from there. So this is pretty much like uh, what I usually uh, like do. And here you can see there's a one Chromecast, which you can actually get the serial connection there. You can do stuff with that. Then there is the Apple AirTag. You can use the Segger J-Link, which you can dump the firmware. And the Apple has done some things there, which are actually funny. But that's another thing. And this actually is based to a one, one research which I read. And of course, there are a bunch of other, other things. One really cool way to figure out how the things work is to lo look at the, uh, this project called OpenWRT. They usually have these pinouts, like in here, there's a Linksys router, which has already the JTAG exposed. You just need to put some some uh, wires over there and so forth. And then one really important part of the recon is that there's this beautiful thing, this, uh, the Federal Communication Commission, yeah? I don't even know what they do, but I'm pretty much interested in this part where they said that if you apply for this ID, you need to provide all the documentation, the internal uh, photos, and the user manuals. So basically, what it means is that, for example, in Apple AirTag, you can see that they have to actually provide the internal pictures of the device, and they have to explain which uh, frequencies they are using, and so forth. So you don't actually even have to purchase a thing you can go to this website and start to navigate which would you like to like research and so forth. So this is actually really cool. And in the picture, we can already see that there are a lot of these gold balloons or gold balls. <laughs> yeah, I promised myself, but yeah. So those are actually the test points for the device. So yeah. And if we start to look at the you know, normal, normal stuff like my personal car key and some, you know, uh, Apple phones, Android phones, and routers. You can actually see that there, there is always the ID at the bottom. Then you take the ID, you go to the website, and you start to navigate, and yeah, you get the idea. And once you have identified what, what's inside the device. You go to this fantastic tool called Google. Then you just say that, give me data sheet of this and that. And you will actually find these data sheets online. And I've seen a lot of these really fishy looking sites, which have the data sheets. 
So I usually try to get them from the manufacturer side, but if that's not like doable, then fuck it. You live once, so I just download it and do it super safely. So yeah. And this is actually one thing which blew my mind because I used to use this trick also when I was testing like mobile applications. So I usually browse to the licenses part in the mobile application, but then one guy showed this at a, <laughs> a another event that you can actually do this in the <coughs> this is a coffee machine from <coughs> unknown company. <coughs> Uh, well, Visma, but we, that's our coffee machine. So we, I noticed that there, there are these licenses, and I start to fiddle around with this thing, and then there was people behind me, and we, ne we were not in Finland, so then I decided that maybe I shouldn't do this, so please take your coffee, and they were looking at me like that, what are you doing? And, but the interesting part is that this coffee machine has something, do, something to do with Turbo Linux, for example. So, pretty cool. So, if the coffee machine runs this, so, yeah. And thanks, Sami. You are probably here somewhere, so you showed this. This is really cool. I, I didn't figure this out myself, but thanks. And like I said, yes, Google, Google stuff. That's, that's like super, super useful tool, so, yeah. And one, one thing which you will find is these fantastic like uh, researches which people have made. For example, this guy made the research because he said he do doesn't want to pay too much and the uh, Apple AirTag is, I don't know, you can get like two with 50 euros or something. So that's not too bad. So he actually researched and reverse engineered the whole thing and then of course, because he did that good stuff will come out of the research, right? So now you can buy these things from AliExpress from, you see, 50 cents to five euros piece. So, and these are actually working with iPhones also because those guys noticed that, hey, this is now open protocol and so forth. So what the hell? So yeah, and I actually ordered these because yeah, it's me. Okay, let's talk about the thing. And if there's older members in the audience, you might remember this fantastic movie. He knew how to deal with the thing. Yeah. So these are like my kind of advices. Some are borrowed, some are stolen, and some are like uh, personal views. But you should like always, the, I, I think that the, We've been talking a lot of this, so you should, if you are doing a product, you should force the users to upgrade the device like regularly and before they actually start to use it like for real, you know, and so forth. And it's <coughs> important to remember to disable all the external connections before you release the product because if it's not needed, it's really not needed and someone will start to play around with it. And yeah, and don't store any secrets in the in the uh, device. And this is probably the thing which people keep repeating, but the TLS and the encryption thing. And th there is <laughs> at least one guy here who is somewhere really really good at man in the middleing. So he will eat you alive if you do that. So just a fair warning. So, how you usually approach any, any of these things? So, usually I prefer to have a minimum at two, th two things, because the first you will like totally sacrifice. You will be the, you know, you just rip it, rip it open and you start to dig in the internals. And the second one, you will use it as a normal user, because you want to understand how the unit works and so forth. And, if you purchase these things from AliExpress, they are like, come on, a couple of euros. So why not take two free shipping included and so forth? So, yeah. And since little boy, I've been tearing down all the things. Some I have 
not been able to fix, and some I have able to, been able to fix, but yeah, that's my kind of approach. So yeah, so now we know everything, so hold my beer. Yeah, this is how easy it is, really. So I purchased these like uh, Apple, Apple related, like, uh, you know, things. Then I started to just open them up, and that's a good use of, you know, 10 euros or something. And then I switched to another product. So, as said, they have actually even identified the test pins inside the thing, but I somehow managed to fuck it up. So, but it really doesn't matter because these are, in my opinion, pretty cheap devices still, so just buy a new one. Now you at least have a reference unit and you know how to open the next one. Yeah, and this was actually a team effort, so we, we, we were looking into this pixel thing and we, we were really, really like uh, going for it and then this happened. So that's a Pixel tablet which kind of died during the, during the investigation. But you can see on the right-hand side that it's the tablet without the display. So there's not too much like moving parts inside the thing uh, other than the display. But well, we kind of lost that. But then we noticed that, well, we shouldn't do this to the second tablet. So at least we still have one. So that's cool. And if you are, you are a person like me, I have some things I need to do during the day. So usually I hack during the night. And when, when you are hacking late, the results are great, right? So I actually messed around with these Apple AirTags quite a lot, uh, quite a long time. Then it kind of told me that you shouldn't do this, but are you sure or not? Just press yes. And if you do it, <coughs> if you do it properly, you can fuck up all the next devices too, because it will remember that. So that that's a really good thing to remember. That please read the banners before you click anything. So basically, I have like two air tags now, which are like working, but there's no firmware inside. So I need to buy a third one and then reprogram the. Other, other devices, so I'm still barely there, but you know. Okay, so what about the equipment itself? What usually do you need? Well, we are aiming for the um, hacking with a budget and absolutely no soldering. So with this stuff, you are able to basically do, do it. You don't have to solder anything if you don't want. Because I've been talking a lot of with people about the hardware hacking, and some people are strongly uh, saying that they are kind of feeling that they don't want to start the hardware hacking because you have to solder. So I'm trying to here prove today that you don't have to. You can do it without soldering. You can manage. So, And you can buy this really cool stuff from the stores like uh, all over the internet and you don't have to spend that much money and if you think that's much money then well usually hobbies they cost some money so a beer costs around 10 euros or something so i don't know three beers for di digital multimeter not bad yeah uh then if we basically uh, remove the budget part, we can, we can order some nifty things like these holders, which are pretty awesome. On the right-hand side, there is this PCB byte, which is kind of a tool. You don't have to solder anything. You just put these sort of metal spikes inside the board, which will connect to a wire, and then you can basically do stuff with the board. And usually, if you notice that there are these test points, which I was talking about, and you identify them as a connector, then you use the PCB byte spikes, put them on the top of the connector, and you are good to go. No soldering was done at all, which is really good. And once you notice that you ran out of hands, you need to do stuff while you are uh, hardware hacking, then you might want to invest to these clamps, which help are your extended kind of arms. 
sort of. And then there is the wizard le level when you start to purchase stuff and you are going deeper in the rabbit hole once you get interested in the, into this field. So at least that's my kind of home lab and it's not too fancy, but with that stuff you are able to do a lot of things already. So I have like a external power supply, oscilloscope and flash readers and really sketchy Chinese devices which do just the stuff I want and yeah, well, yes. But just a friendly reminder when you are on a budget that before you're starting to connect in the CND, you pr probably want to just to check that, well, because if you don't know, know this, the G C and D should be G and D, which stands for ground. So sometimes they do these weird, weird like markings, and sometimes the Chinese guys they actually wire the power in reverse way, and they they do they do a lot of stuff. So some some safety checks should be done uh, before you just connect your really really cheap devices to your computer, and so. So, I actually briefly mentioned about the NRF development kit. So, I really love this board because this is kind of uh, the board which usually is always available in these electronic stores. So, this is a board which you can use to play around with stuff and learn, learn like a hardware hacking in a safe way, so sort of a boot camp. And for example, this, this, I wasn't actually getting any money from the Nordic uh, related to this, but I just love this board, so that's why I'm, why I'm telling about this. But this is actually a really, really neat board in a way that it has, it's able to speak a lot of protocols. You can do really weird experiments with it, and it even has this Segar Chaling debugger, which is really useful when you are like hardware hacking some stuff. And like I said, this is around 40 bucks, 50 bucks, something like that. So it's, I think it's not that bad for what it can do. And it has all, all the pins are documented and so forth. So if you want to learn how to identify pins and so forth, this is really good because it's open, open board. And it's basically built around this specific chip. And this is not the latest chip from them, but this is the kind of, they usually have a development kit for a certain chip family. And this is for this certain chip this development kit. And just to give you an idea who is using this, so like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of these like uh, tags and really cheap like, uh, I don't know, I lost my keys things. So you, you can see that the NRF is pretty, pretty awesome. In, it's used in a lot of products, so really nice. So. Now we're going to do extreme demo. We, we are <coughs> basically looking at the using uh, Nordic's provided program, which is able to show the uh, actual board. And in the board, we can see that our application core is totally empty. We don't have anything there. So the, uh, basically, the unit doesn't have any program installed. Then we're going to do this really fancy program, which actually prints just hello hackers and keeps incrementing the number. And it actually blinks the LED at the same time. So this is the super fancy program. But you can see it's, it's written in C. You can, you can use, use like Rust or whatever, but I, I, I like C. I'm not ready for Rust yet, but maybe someday. But as you can see, this pretty much shows you how to compile stuff, deploy it to the uh, actual board, and then how it behaves, and so forth. And if we take a look at the, uh, after we have programmed our card, we can see that now our application is in certain place on the board. 
It's actually installed in the board, and we can see it over there now. So after that, we can, we can use these uh, tools provided by the Nordic. We can actually start like, uh, looking into, into the board. We can read, read the memory and so forth. So it's kind of fun to play around with. And we can even dump the firmware and see is it pretty much the same as, as it was when we compiled it. So this is what I'm trying to say here is that you can experiment with the change in the firmware, then deploying it to the board, then trying to dump it and so forth. And maybe if you are doing some CTFs or whatever, this is actually also pretty nice trick to understand that if you have some device which needs the firmware to be dumped, then you can basically play around and see that are you able to do it with this, this guy, for example. And one neat thing about this guy is that you can also like, uh, debug your program at the hardware level. So you can basically uh, start debugging the actual program running, running it on the board and then stop the execution on the board, which is actually uh, really nice uh, as a learning, learning um, experiment. And in here, we can see that once we have connected to the board and we're going to say the CPU that halt, it will stop the execution of the program. And the program will wait what's going to happen next. And in here, the next thing we're going to do, we, we are just single stepping the program. And actually, yes, we do one single step, and then we're going to do like 100 single steps. So execute like uh, instructions. And this doesn't do any, it was really difficult to fit to one slide what, what, what is the kind of effect here. But you probably understand that you can basically pause the execution and continue it as you, as you want to be able to like, uh, see the execution and the flow of the, of the actual program. Uh, yeah, and if I would try to do comp more complex like, uh, example here, that would be like an immediate suicide here. So, yeah. Okay, so. <coughs> I, I, I was told that it would be fun to see some like, uh, real examples. So back at my house, I have one of these like, uh, things. And my wife uses this for her, her stuff. And then I kind of took the router, opened it up, put all the wires in there, and started to hack. And she started to say that, where's the network? And then I realized that this doesn't really pan out. So I, I had to get my own. So I got from this Finnish flea market, 29 euros. I got my own. And then I did also the uh, same things to this device and started to play around with it. And as you can see, this is still used by the <coughs> Finnish ISPs. And I, I just wanted to give something to the, if the operators have a table here somewhere, you have something to talk about when you look at the, when you have latest updated this stuff. So you're welcome. So yeah, we are still using this. <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's probably not, you know, 5G and everything, but you get my point. And this is really, really like a nice device because when you open it up, you, you can immediately see that there, there are some, some like stuff inside, which usually you have. And you, you can identify some stuff from the board immediately. Usually when I see the four pins, I know that there's like a serial connector hidden somewhere. And it's pretty easy to find out how, how to measure, measure it and find out what, is the, what pin is which, which one. But here you can see the layout. And then using my 15 euros cost logic analyzer from China, I was able to find out that it really is what, what I'm looking for. So I just hooked the cables, uh, ran the program, and started to look that 
what, what the analyzer says. The, so the analyzer is able to understand protocols, and it found out that this is URT, the serial port. So yes, we were good to go. And of course, and yeah, just to make a point that the $15 logic analyzer is still good, so I, I wanted to use and present it here. And then, uh, of course, the EEPROM, which, which was the chip on the device, you can dump that too, because sometimes it's useful to play around with the EEPROM and perhaps reprogram it to the board and then uh, start to look what happens. And I usually document my stuff using this screen marker and the flash means that each time when that light blinks, it seems that the device is doing something to flash memory. So I, I thought it was a good idea to put it there for myself. And in the end, what we're going get, to get from the device is that uh, the EEPROM contains the U-boot stuff, and the flash contains the whole HTML, CGI, what not. So basically, at this point, we could start looking into more vulnerabilities once we have all the uh, code in front of our uh, eyes. OK, then I actually added a second example. I went to this uh, IT store, which is pretty near here, and they have this, uh, what is this called, outlet or something. So customers return stuff, and they resell that. And I, I noticed this guy over there. It says uh, the price has been reduced 82 pros. And that's for me, it's like, oh, fuck, this, this cannot be real. And of course, I went and I purchased that stuff. And they actually warned me that condition B means that someone might have opened a plastic bag inside. And I was only looking for a circuit board, so pretty much my, my game, this one. So of course, I immediately opened this one too. And as you can see, they are so kind that they even provide the connectors to us from this board. And using my really, really crappy cheap uh, digital multimeter from Klaus Olson. They are not giving me any money to say in the name, but just to telling you where you can buy stuff. So I could find out the pins. And then, of course, what I did next, I actually um, put some wires in there, and I put it back together. And of course, then you, you got shell to the device. and. In the end, you can see that it's not, it's basically running, running some Linux thing inside and, you know, then you can start to play around. And the thing is that there might be even easier way for this to get the firmware, but I just want to make the point that you go to the store, you buy something and most probably you are able to like lift the firmware from the device. So it's not that like hard in my opinion. If you just want to like look into stuff and so forth, so it's it's pretty easy easy thing to do. And if I can do it, you can do it. So yeah, this is the second last slide. So you are now relieved from this. But I would say that please don't be afraid of the soldering. So. It's not that hard. I understand you don't want to do it like here with 15 people around you, but try it. But with, with these uh, like, uh, tips and tricks, you, you don't have to actually use the actual soldering at all. And it doesn't matter which, which uh, proto board or kind of sandbox system do you want to use, but uh, it's if you have one of those boards on you and you can play around with that, you, I promise you that you learn a lot of the, about the architecture, the chips and so forth, because you see that this thing affects this guy and so forth. And I just love the Nordic stuff because they have decent like a, a development environment and they have good documentation and pretty cool products, in my opinion, and they are like a mainstream provider in wireless chips, so forth. 
And there's also a huge community over here which, which are kind of not shouting out loud that they know stuff, but please talk to them because they, they know a lot of stuff about the hardware. And I'll be here all weekend. I'm, I usually drool when we start to talk about the hardware, so I'm passionate about that. Yeah, and ask questions like explain, explain like I'm five manner like I do. That's like the ask good questions, you get good answers, sort of. Yeah, and have fun while doing it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's about it. So I hope this will give you at least the uh, passion that I, because that guy was d doing some weird stuff on the stage, stage I want to do hardware hacking. So that's my kind of only purpose for this presentation. So thank you. <laughs>